And so now what I'm going to do is call up uh, James Tucker, who is going to present on some really interesting findings from the Boston Consulting Group. So that's what's happening globally. Let's find out what's happening in Ontario. And then we're going to have some time at the end for Q&A. So I do hope you stick around. So James Tucker is a principal in the Toronto office of the Boston Consulting Group. He's a sessional lecturer at U of T's Rockman School of Management, and he sits on the board of West Park Healthcare. Hopefully you all know that BCG is a global management consulting firm that advises the world's leading organizations on their most critical challenges. BCG also seeks to make a difference in the communities in which they live by working with social impact organizations. I like the language, right? Social impact organizations. Prior to joining BCG, James had a 15-year history in sales, marketing, and business development at multiple companies, including CTV and Molson Coors. James is particularly active in the community, supporting several charities, including Junior Achievement of Canada, Heart and Stroke Foundation, and the Next 36, something that's very close to our heart here at Mars. And he was recently invested with the Ontario Medal for Good Citizenship by the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario. So he's here to talk to you today about the preliminary, and I'm underscoring preliminary findings, of BCG's mapping of the social impact sector, applying the techniques, that the business techniques that BCG is able to use as a diagnostic tool to uncover the needs of organizations in this sector. Please join me in welcoming James. Thanks, Allison. Um, so three months ago, and it's only three months ago, a small BCG team came together and said, essentially, how can we fix all of the problems in uh, Canadian society, believe it or not? A small, again, small aspirations. And we said, well, the biggest challenge we have is we don't know what they are. So how do you undertake massive transformational change without a good understanding of the problem you're trying to solve. You run around with a bunch of solutions looking for a problem. So what we did was um, we undertook a diagnostic of the overall sector, and the charitable sector more specifically, to really get underneath the, um, the needs in the sector. We wanted to map the size, the scope, the variance, um, but most importantly the needs. And ultimately where this is going and we're not there yet, is to really build a needs-based segmentation so that we can tease out where the critical problems are in a de-averaged way and apply um, our ability to the, to the problems we're best set up to solve, as opposed to taking a peanut butter smear approach to every problem. And so um, it was a three-stage journey. We moved from a lit search. I mean, there's lots of good thinking in the field that's gone on. Um, we moved into a series of qualitative interviews and landed on a quantitative survey that we deployed just two weeks ago um, to 35,000 charities across Canada. And we got overwhelming response with no incentive. Uh, 1,600 respondents completed the survey. And we started to cut that data over the course of the weekend and early this morning. And we're gonna share with you today an emerging picture and, o and only an emerging picture. There's lots of work to be done on a data set that large. Um, so. You'll notice when it starts right away with no build, well, that's fine. Um, you'll notice I was very um, loose in, term, in, in, in talking about what we were trying to map. And the reason for that is that when we started this, we were buried in nomenclature. And I think if I heard anything um, f through today, I've heard that that was a fairly consistent theme, that people spend a significant amount of time debating what to call things as opposed to debating what to do about them. And so, you know, we tried, we resisted actually redefining that. Because there's a sense, of course, for us to want to impose our structure and, and come up with the right definition. And the reality is, um, it's help. That's from our perspective. It's as simple as that. And uh, a mentor of mine at BCG actually shared with me fairly early on that ours is a helping profession. And that similarly, I think a lot of what the folks in this room do with other organizations is help them. So what we would like to do, um, in our own small way, uh, channeling Jerry Maguire, is help you help others help themselves. And I think, you know, it's pretty clear that BCG has a pretty strong history in helping organizations. Um, 
I've played uh, a small part recently in helping to write that chapter, as have many others at the firm. Uh, we make it as inclusive as we can and pull the best passion and people together around solving these problems. Um, and we see this work really as the first step in systematizing our involvement, ensuring we apply our limited resources against the most pressing challenges and problems where we're best suited to deliver optimal outcomes. I'm sure it's a challenge you can all relate to, that you have limited resources and a desire to create significant impact. So how do you focus? Now, just from my perspective, to make it personal for a minute, playing up on the theme of kids, you know, why did I get involved? I want to tell you a little story about my kids. So this is my boy, Brandon. He's three years old. We built an Anukshuk together a summer ago. And um, a while ago, we were walking down the street in downtown Toronto. And there was a homeless gentleman sleeping on a grate. And my son said, Daddy, what's wrong with the man? And I told him that you know, he was hungry, probably, and that he didn't have a place to sleep. And he said to me, uh, well, he can have my snack. You know, we're talking about a cheese string, but he can have my snack. And you can give it to him, Dad. And um, I smiled um, at the generosity, the simple generosity of children. And, um, but I ushered him past the man. And I said, uh, oh, no, 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 dear. We have to move along. And I think about that a fair bit. I never did give him the snack. And I, I, upon reflection, that's largely driven by shame. And I was ashamed that we allow that to exist in our society, in my city. I was ashamed that I didn't know what that man needed and how to give it to him and what was appropriate. And I was ashamed that I didn't have the courage to ask. And so I don't want to be ashamed about that anymore. I want to figure out what people like that in our society need and how we can better give it to them so my son can have the right answer and not be hushed and ushered along. My second son, Michael, one year old, doesn't have as many words, can ask me the whole series of questions. Um, but he's one of the most giving people I know. And so one of the words he does have is share. And I spent this weekend uh, at a children's birthday party. And I noticed that all he was doing in the room was going to the toy box, taking out a toy, and walking around to every person that didn't have a toy and giving it to them and saying, share. And he did that for two straight hours. To adults who had no desire to actually have toys in their hands while they were trying to have an adult conversation. But the principle is pretty strong. And I think at the end of the day, um, we've got a lot to learn from our children. I certainly have a lot to learn from mine. So we want to help you help others. And I think none of the stats that are going to pile up on the page behind me are actually going to be surprising to anyone in this room. I'm sure everyone has their own to add, and then this list will certainly grow. But it's no, what it is a reminder of is that the work is challenging, the need is real, and the issues are critical to get right. And so we want to help you continue to do the great things that you're doing. And so it's about optimizing impact for us. It's about growing impact and figuring out how to do that. So we talked about a three-phase journey. Phase one for us was to create a high-level view of the social impact map and then to do a deep dive on charitable organizations. Now that's partially driven by the fact that that was the easiest sector for us to wrap our hands around and get real data on in a short time frame. We wanted to expand that more broadly into not-for-profits. And again, we're not fussed about the nomenclature. You can call these buckets whatever you like. We're using some common terminology for those purposes of discussion. And we want to then get into you know, social-themed for-profit businesses and corporate social responsibility programs. Again, call them what you like. We view them as different ways to help. And what we're going to talk most about today is that sector overview, the size of the sector, the needs and the beginnings of a segmentation, and how those vary. Because it's the variance that's actually interesting. In aggregate, there's an average need. But when you break it out by sector, when you break it out by cause, when you break it out by type of activity, you'll see that people actually need very different things 
from the other players in the ecosystem. And ultimately, we want to use that to identify solutions. And we'll continue that work in subsequent efforts. So as far as ingoing hypotheses, we had a whole bunch of these. Some of them proved out, some of them didn't, to be honest. Um, but we're going to talk about four of them today, and largely speaking, four that did prove out, and the data that sits behind them, and then open it up for discussion afterwards. So one was that, that de-averaging that we talked about, that it's essential. It's essential to pull these segments apart, peel the onion, get to the true need by segment before you can figure a solution. Two, that there's a lot of fragmentation, largely speaking, in the sector overall. Now, some people have argued on either side of this, whether it's a good thing, whether it's a bad thing. We have some stats that suggest, certainly for some organizations, this isn't helping them. And that there's an opportunity to grow scale and drive more impact. That that impact then must be measured. And it must be measured in a way that is somewhat systemic. Understanding that there'll be variance in types of impact, but that accountability and transparency are important for the sector. And that entrepreneurial behavior is on the rise, not just within organizations that consider them pure, themselves pure play. So organizations that say this is our primary raison d'etre is to generate social impact through commercial activities. But those organizations who think their raison d'etre isn't commercial are engaging in greater numbers in commercial activity to help fund their core mission and extend their impact. So to begin, we talked to a whole bunch of industries in the sector. And uh, we got a good view. It helped us refine our hypotheses before we went to quantitative study. As you all can imagine, you can only go to quantitative once. So we really had to get the questions right. This is a sampling of the organizations we spent a significant amount of time with. Some of you are in the room tonight that really gave us your thoughts firsthand and helped us shape and sharpen our perspective. When we get to an overall size, I think what's interesting is that in the charitable sector, we have a fairly large overall number. And this is where we got 1,600 respondents. So our level of confidence around this size based on the overall um, population is quite high. So these numbers were really tight on. These are the numbers where we did our deep dive today. And the significance in the $200 billion of the overall sector is, is, I think, can't be overstated, right? It's large, it's important, it needs caring, it needs nurturing, and people need to pay attention. It's not news to anyone in this room, but it's news we hope to carry forward to people who aren't in the room and aren't thinking about it. Where we want to go from here, and this, this is where the numbers get less certain, these are based on public domain data, expert interviews, and a lot of triangulation. So we want to refine these numbers, and certainly the question mark number, until we get to an overall view in terms of the size of the sector. And again, apply the same sense of breaking them down and seeing where the needs are. So I think on a national level, one of the things that we found interesting was that certain provinces, economic powerhouses, over-index on charitable expenditures on a per capita basis. So this was actually surprising. We weren't expecting this. And you could look at this either way. You could say that there's some magic there. There's some magic in um, ad, you know, more advanced economies that allow for increased focus in charitable sector. Um, you know, our initial thought actually going into this was that since all communities have a certain base level of infrastructure, that this, the um, more rural communities would actually over-index on a provincial basis. That those people tend to be more actively involved in their communities, and we found out that wasn't the case. So we've got a lot of unpacking to do underneath this. We've got to take this down from the provincial level to the region and city level, and get a sense of which areas are really driving that impact, again, in a more granular way, before we can get to root cause. Because we're not at root cause here. This is still 30,000 feet in the air. So. As far as the ecosystem, there are a lot of actors in this ecosystem. Again, we've picked a, a nomenclature here. You don't have to agree with it, largely speaking. Again, this is based on the survey we did extrapolated out over the total number. We've got over 65,000 
focused in program delivery. So base of the pyramid. Most of the organizations view their primary activity in this place. 7,000 pure funders. They're a pure play funder. 6,000 in policy and advocacy, 2,000 in enablement, 2,000 in research, and 1,500 in information networks. So there's a lot of players. What we really need to get to now is how they interact and really which ones, when we unpack this, have second order activities that flow from one puzzle piece into another. Because it's not me see. Right? Lots of organizations have two areas of focus. So as far as specific needs, this won't be a surprise to people. right? The top three activities, on average for everyone, I think people could have predicted without a study. right? So you've got generating day-to-day -day funds, increasing awareness, recruiting and retaining committed staff. Sounds like the kind of things you guys worry about on a daily basis, I would assume. Right? But what if we de-average it? So what if we take one cause and look at development and housing compared to the environment? Say, what do they care about? We think they care about the same things? So, no, they don't. Right? We ask them what their primary uh, challenges and opportunities were, priorities. Development and housing, 300% more likely than the environment to list measuring or communicating social impact as a top priority. So 300%, three times as likely to do it, right? Vice versa, the environment, 300% likely to list generating or increasing the impact as top priority. So they want to do more. They don't just want to be able to measure it and tell people about it. Others think they're maybe doing enough, but actually it's the magic of quantifying it and getting that message across. 60% more likely to list generating funds for major investments as a top priority, which you can understand. Right, in, a, in, in a development sector, versus 65% more likely to list increasing awareness of organization or cause as a top priority. So you see it's impact, awareness, uh, measurement, and capital. And finally, dealing with regulators and legal matters, big issue for the developers, recruiting volunteers, more straight line for environment. So if we were trying to develop a solution, broadly speaking, for the, for the sector, we'd have to do something, for the sector's most pressing problems, we'd have to do something vastly different depending on where we're focusing. And that's the magic when we start really unpacking this. And we're, we're not there yet. This is still about as aggregate as you can get. So what if we took it a level further, or at least a different lens? What if we looked at those organizations that cite themselves as growing rapidly versus those organizations that, are in, that view themselves as being in decline? What do they need? You can imagine it would be different, right? Um, first of all, fundamentally from a structural standpoint, different. Those growing rapidly primarily are operating at a regional or provincial level. Those declining rapidly primarily in arts or religious groups tend to be more mature and they view themselves as declining. I think the, the stat was um, over 50% in the next few years. So rapidly. Right? If you look at either ends of the poll, what do they need? Well, so they're growing rapidly almost entirely focused on program delivery. So the program deliverers are growing. People are seeing impact and outcomes that, they, that they're reinvesting in. Declining rapidly, obviously these are the people who have grown to a certain size and are now facing what they feel as inevitable decline. And they're not doing anything with products and services. More importantly, impact measurement. Those that are growing rapidly are measuring their impact. Those that are declining aren't. So capital starved due to growth, interesting. They're growing rapidly, but it's expenses that they're growing on, not capital. So they're growing themselves out of their own existing infrastructure. They're getting to a point where they need to build to sustain their growth. They need funding rather than fundraising. And the declining folks, they're not plugged into the ecosystem. They're siloed, they're isolated. They don't view themselves as being connected to other groups. So moving into another hypothesis, off the average, into fragmented, subscale, and isolated. It's a provocative title, right? Um, yes, a lot of the sector is driven, by, is driven local versus regional, provincial, international, or national. But what about that makes us feel at its subscale? Well, it's not just that measurement. It's the stuff underneath it, which is they're small, relatively speaking, those organizations. They're... Um, they have a significant challenge with generating funds for day-to-day. -day. So they have some issues. 
uh, around that, that scale could help them with. They're likely to be isolated, these, these local organizations. They're, more, they're not part of a sector network. They don't even, in large cases, know about a relevant network for them. And they're more likely to have no network at all. And they're stagnating or declining in overall size. There's something that's in their way from breaking through. And they list as a top priority accessing that ecosystem that they're isolated from in large numbers. So, lack of standard metrics. So, the current measurement, those that are measuring, and actually a good number are, right? 60% are measuring their impact in some way. But they're primarily measuring output. So, units delivered as opposed to impact. Um, and very few are actually measuring societal return on investment. And there's a variance in metrics and methods. So again, less than 10% use standard. 40% cite a lack of, an appro of appropriate metrics and no audience as their reasons. And funders have a role to play. So there's no requirement. And a lot of people have cited, more than 50%, they don't do it because nobody asks them to do it. As opposed to they don't do it because it's not the right thing to do. Right? They don't do it because it's not forced upon them. And the charities the, who pri whose primary activity is funding from that puzzle slide before, they're not forcing accountability through measures and metrics on the people they fund. So the challenge is there's a general trend that I'm sure some of you are experiencing that donors don't want to be donors anymore. They want to be investors. And so as that becomes more prevalent, those organizations who are resisting measuring a return in any material way are going to lose out on access to that fund. So commercial activity, very briefly. Uh, this is one thing we're not supposed to do at BCG. So we've done straight line projections based on one data point. Um, so b bear in mind that that's not the way it actually may go forward as far as the project projections go. But the 2011 projections sound. And the 2010 number is accurate. So the 2010 number is based on the survey data, and the 2011 number is based on the question we asked in the survey data, are you going to start doing it next year? And fully 10% more organizations are going to do it next year than we're doing it this year, and that it is engaged in commercial activities. Now those commercial activities have to be social in nature, create some sort of measurable social impact, but drive profit that can then either be harvested or reinvested in driving more social impact. 2012, 13, and 14 are questionable. Right? But if it was to go straight line, if you could believe that that growth would continue, more than half in five years of organizations would be involved in some type of commercial activity. And they do it for three big reasons. They do it, obviously, to contribute to their mission and goals, increase brand awareness, because commercial activity draws attention from different quarters and different areas, and, of course, for financial reasons. And that year-over-year -year growth, as we said, implies that over half will get there. So our prediction, and I can tell you that one of the charitable foundations that I sit on is, is offsetting a shortfall in provincial funding through commercial activities, is that as funding pressure increases, and it will only increase, this is trend is going to continue to grow. 10% might be conservative. So where are we going from here? Well, in the short term, we're going to answer whatever questions you may have. But in the longer term, we're going to be finalizing the analysis because, as I said, the data has come in even over the course of today. And so please view most of these numbers as work in progress. They were cut with data that we got through on Friday when we moved from 1,350 responses to 1,700, which I think is where we are at, uh, at close today. Um, we're going to be developing solutions in response to the needs that we uncover, the needs that we uncover at a de-average level, the needs that we choose to address. And we're going to be then extending that analysis to the other slices of the sector that we haven't even started to address here. So I think beyond questions or comments right now, we have an email set up. 
that you're welcome to write down if you want it to be blind or just you know, don't feel like embarrassing me in public and want to fire questions in to a blind box, um, you can feel free to send it to the BCG email address. But I think we have a few minutes to open the floor to questions now. Thank you. We can sit. Wow. OK. We're not supposed to do this, right? It's drink water. No bottled water? No bottle. I don't know how bottles get into Mars. There's never bottles on um, Any questions? Anyone? It was a lot of information. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yeah? OK, thank you. Um, anything at all? Who wants to come to school with me next year? Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. There's a mic right there, please. Thank you. So yeah, thank you for your presentation. It's a lot of lot of stuff to sit through. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you could talk about the, the just the importance of um, of you you're collecting data from agencies and and organizations that are across Canada that are in the trenches, so to speak, that are doing the work. And I, I just wonder if you could talk about also the importance of, of also collecting data from the stakeholders of who we're helping. So in other words, the, the youth, the, the moms, the father, the single father, single mother. How are you going to get those type of qualitative data so that you can actually feel that you, you actually were in the trenches to, 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 to use the information you're going you're gonna, to If you could talk a little bit about that, it would be great. Sure. So it's a great question. Um, I think that when we do, when we isolate where we have the opportunity to drive some impact, that's when we start to engage the community. I think we have to face the reality at BCG that we have a, we have a limited slice of our overall resource that we can devote to an effort like this, and that we've got to be very selective where we start to engage all the stakeholders who might be around a cluster of activity. So when we identify that cluster, We'll develop our overall outreach plan, which would certainly include um, the recipients of the aid as well as the deliverers of the aid and any ancillary stakeholder groups associated with it. Please just go to the microphone if you have a question. Hi, hi. My name is uh, David Locke, and I'm from uh, an organization called PACT, and I'm a volunteer. Um, a question. Uh, during the third phase, um, does a lot of this uh, point towards best practice models? Is that part of the evolution of the process? Ultimately, you know, if you go back to your, your motherhood statement when you first started this thing, is, you know, how, how can we positively change our social infrastructures? You know. Ultimately, you want to identify the most effective delivery models, and is that the end game of this process? So, uh, thank you. It's uh, it's a good question. It's another good question. I think the um, certainly an aim. I would hesitate to call it the aim, but an aim would be to identify best best in class, uh, create some vignettes, and distill what we can learn from organizations that are relatively speaking more successful versus those that are struggling, and figure out what we can take from one and bring to another. I mean, that actually is a large part of the essence of what we do you know, outside, of the, outside of the social sector. And so if we can get to a, if we can get to a view that says, you know, in this sector, these types of models are working. They're driving more outcomes, more impact, um, more, more uh, you know, um, financial viability. Then what is the root cause driver of that? Right? Is it the model, the structure itself? Is it the value proposition? Is it um, the location, is it proximity to resources? What is it about that model that works? And then how can we abstract that out and use those lessons, again, to, um, to solve for the challenges in whichever subsector or subsegment we're talking about? Now, the challenge, again, is we can't do that everywhere. So I think, uh, as you said, in the third leg of the journey, that's probably the right place. Once we've started to say, we know where we want to focus, and we know what problems we're set up to solve, who in that space is exhibiting best practice from a structure process delivery perspective and how can we 
enhance that, grow that, or just replicate that with others who are operating in that space. Hi. Hi, uh, my name is Lynn Daly and I'm the uh, Executive Director of Christie Ossington Neighborhood Centre and the Loft Youth Centre for Social Enterprise and Innovation in Toronto. And um, my question is that um, we are all necessarily um, focused on measuring impact, but we're doing that in the face of a trend of governments and investors de-investing in our ability to actually um, have the investment to to actually do that, do that. work. Yeah. So we see uh, all levels of government across across um, all areas of government removing any portion of funding to that administrative work. So we're kind of asking to have our cake and eat it too. We're creating more and more demands for measurement and impact, but we're allowing. Um, and accepting no investment in that in that work, so yes, we're you know we're we're developing social enterprises and we're you know we're we're doing very innovative work, but we're you know doing it with a uh, foot on our neck, so it's a little difficult in that context to you know m move forward uh, in a robust, vigorous way, and it'd be great if while you're measuring. Um, the uh, responsibility of, of the charitable sector that you also, you know, call to task or you, you bring that discussion into the, the forum for the need for actual investment in that evaluation work, in the, the um, reflection, in the um, sharing of, of failures and um, successes, like how, how you operationalize that, you have all stakeholders understanding how that convergence can actually happen if you really want to make change. So. Great question. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, I think you're right. That's a, it's a great question. And the, um, you know, one, of our, one of our hypotheses you saw was around measuring impact, but the truth is uh, the how becomes critically important and the what resources are required to deliver on it becomes a second order question that you, know, you have to solve for. And so, you know, a consistent methodology um, might be helpful, but I take your point, we take your point that tying that to the administrative burden and the cost burden that places on the sector is critically important if you're making the case to funders that you want to understand impact and ROI, you want us to track it, there's a payment required to do so. So I think it's part of a much larger discussion about how we can help each other in this sector think about this work a little bit differently and are there any opportunities for some kind of synergies? There's a lot of um, social enterprises or social ventures emerging in this space. There are groups like Charity Intelligence and others that are percolating up and I think we really need to have a, a deeper level of discussion about what social impact metrics mean for us and, and how, we, how we view that. So um, not an answer except to say that there's lots of stuff going on. There's some global movements in this space and, and uh, a topic, a much deeper dive needed for another day for sure. Ruth? Thanks. Uh, Ruth Bastido, I work over at the um, Initiative for Women in Business with the Next Steps Entrepreneur Program. Uh, one of the things that I'm interested in in terms of this study is how deeply you're going to go into looking at the product and service mix that a lot of these companies are getting into. And I'm particularly interested, are a lot of these companies developing products and services, companies, not for profit? volunteer. <laughs> are, are these organizations looking at products and services that are related to their, their core business and area of knowledge, or are they going completely outside of their areas and, and getting into other lines of business that are, are completely different? Without, without giving you a detailed answer, um, it is something we plan to look at. We haven't looked at it yet. The general trends we've been able to see from the data without doing really deep analysis uh, are that they tend to focus on products that are very, uh, very much related at best one step adjacencies from their core mission. That there is still some sense of the uh, social mandate in their commercial activity. But to be continued in terms of a, a deeper view. <clears throat> Carolyn? Oh, hi. Carolyn Acker, Pathways to Education. Um, I, I think what you're doing is really excellent. It's outstanding. I'm Thank you. Very interested in what you're finding out. 
I want to ask you if I can have a copy. I want more. I want more. Okay, now here comes my question. I've, uh, I'm uh, impatient for change at the ground level. Mm. People keep doing the same things over and over, and we're not really, it's not working. So tell me a little bit more. I know you're just at the beginning, and you're going to go phase two and phase three. Mm -hmm. Tell me, or tell us a little bit more about how what you're doing is going to change behavior on the ground at the neighborhood level by these agencies. Like, did you ask a question when you put out your survey? How many of you want to get and come, you know, at the stage three, want to join a focus, want to, you know, want to change, whatever? Yeah. <laughs> what, what's your thinking there? I'm curious. So, uh, thank you. Um, and I think we were, there's, there's one thing that was clear to us, uh, and it's, it's a typical BCG answer, so, is that numbers don't lie. And that uh, our anticipated response rate for the survey was about 500. The fact that we got three times that um, told us that there is significant, and far in, far in excess of what every expert, some of whom are in the room, told us we would ever possibly get out of that sector without offering an incentive. Right? They said, you're not going to get more. 500 is a bold aspiration. Statistical significance, go for 80%, 95% you'll never make. I mean, this, this is the type of guidance you know, that, that we got. Um, and you know, people were hopeful, but you know, they wanted to help us manage our expectations. And the fact that three times the people responded than we could ever have anticipated told me that there's a hunger for participation in this activity. And the only thing we offered in exchange was a copy of the answer. And nine, and we, but we forced people in that. It was completely blind otherwise. But if you wanted the answer, you had to give us your email address. And over 90% said, please send me the answer. And if you look at the qualitative comments, because we had an open text field at the end of the survey, and I just went through them all this morning, um, consistently they said, I want to know. I want to I wanna succeed. I want to do it differently, particularly because we framed a lot of the questions in terms of challenges. What are your greatest challenges? What are your greatest challenges? What are your greatest challenges? And so people were saying, well, well I'd really love to know if everybody in my sector has the same challenge. And then how we're going to change things is we're going to bring those people together, right? And we're going to say, wait, we've got commonality of purpose within a sector. We've got commonality of need. We've got a group of people who are right now trying to solve the same problem in a thousand places across the country in isolation. And we're going to do our best to tee up connection of those disparate points. Great. Yes. Yes. Uh, my name is Bianca. My issue is oil and mining, rural Ontario. What can we do to bring Mars to them or bring them here in Toronto? But we need to connect with them. We have reached the levels that we cannot longer think that we are not part of rural Ontario or rural every province in Canada. It seems that we're replicating the same thing that is happening in the Athabasca in Alberta. That is happening systematically in every province. Smaller or larger scale, it doesn't matter, but it is happening. So the model that we have here at Mars, that we're privileged to have you here, how can we connect with them to help one another? That will be a great answer. Thank you. Sorry, connect with whom? I missed the first part of your question. How can we connect with? Is oil and mining rural Ontario? Oil and mining? How can we connect with them to help one another? Because if we lose the farmlands, we lose our self, how can we say? Food production, water supply. If it is damaged, we're ruined. So how can we help? So in connecting with rural communities and connecting with some of those other kinds of folks. So I don't know. No, so, I mean, I think there, there is great opportunities to, you know, I mean, this, this is a very urban you know, program, right? In downtown Toronto, you're absolutely right. And you know, 
uh, there is a connection through some of the regional innovation centers. There's 14 of them throughout Ontario. We're trying to connect with those folks who are in the more mainstream innovation area, get them to think about social innovation differently. They're going to get us access into new communities. So we're certainly working that way. Um, but I don't know if I have a specific answer. That's what I think. The Skull World Forum model is fantastic. Shouldn't we be doing something like that over there or bring them here or connect through technology? so we can have those world forums, Canadian yep. forum, yep. just to brainstorm and come up with solutions. Yep, so there are proposals. One of the things that I've asked the Skull World Forum to do is think about holding satellites in other places that would allow us to connect in through technology. So they're considering that. But I, I do think there is this sort of sweet spot that they have at Oxford about bringing together that select group of folks that they, um, that they choose. And I think they're not quite ready for that kind of approach. And we are doing lots of other things here. You know, we held the first social entrepreneurship summit here in 2007. So we're having quite, and as you know, because you come to so many of them, there's quite a lot of different events here at Mars that we're trying to have some of these discussions. But that, um, it's a proposal. We'll see what they say. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Nabil. I'm an assistant editor at Social Finance here at Sigurd Mars. And uh, thank you for your presentations. They're really interesting. I had a question about the report on the BCG social measurement. And uh, two small questions, actually. One, do you plan to engage with uh, the government over this, share your findings and work with them? And secondly, you, of the organization that you showed, there were over a thousand that were in information, uh, trans information management and uh, marketing. So are you planning to partner with any of those to share those findings with the wider community? Thank you. So I think um, as far as government, uh, you know, we, have, we don't have a specific action plan targeted to one stakeholder. So for us, uh, you know, it was about preparing the report at a minimum for ourselves, sharing it more broadly, and actually, you know, although this is <laughs> new to BCG, open sourcing it as much as possible. So when we said kick it back out to the 1,600 organizations that brought it in, we imagine that some of them will use it to engage with government directly. So for us, um, there's, you know, do we plan to engage with government? Yes. Um, but we're one group. Right? I'd like to make the knowledge available so that everyone can engage with government um, better informed. And I think that's, that's BCG's vision for the work. Um, the, uh, as far as a, a specific technology partner to help us distribute the information, we, you know, we haven't thought about that yet. Hi. Hi. Uh, so thanks for the presentation. I work in the same sector as you and do uh, pro bono advisory as part of that. So uh, awesome to see uh, the work you guys have been doing. Uh, two quick questions. One around, um, you spoke about the approach and the desire to so go through the three phases and then mm -hmm. look at uh, areas where you'd want to deep uh, dive, dive and focus in. So mm -hmm. subsectors or sectors across. Uh, that, that you'd look at and then bring people together in, mm -hmm. which makes a ton of sense. The only, I guess, question that came to mind was, is there any consideration around this idea of, and I know some of uh, our competitors talk about they don't take an industry approach because they think ideas just keep circling around in the same industry without being uh, renewed. So mm -hmm. if you're going to choose specific sectors to look at, any consideration around bringing some of the others who may not be from that sector but have addressed the issues that sector is facing more effectively over time into that conversation so that those silos are, are, are broken up a little bit? Mm -hmm. So just, just uh, one thought, your thoughts on that would be great. And then the second piece, I know you mentioned the report once it comes out uh, would be shared with the participants. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to know whether it would be more broadly and openly shared, and then whether the data behind it would also be shared on the open source uh, theme you picked up on? Sure. So, um, so let, let me start with the first question. I think that um, with the way we're thinking about the segmentation isn't sector focused. So we showed you actually a sector view, because that's the easiest view to cut. Right? So uh, based on when the data came in, we wanted to give you a glimpse of how we might de-average it. But the truth is the segmentation we want to build is a needs-based segmentation, which is the approach we, we are more recently taking in business. And the needs-based segmentation would say, you know, what are the common sets of needs agnostic of other requirements? 
and we'll bring people together in a dialogue around needs as opposed to a dialogue around education. And you will find that in those needs-based groupings, there will be organizations of varied size, focusing on varied causes, that will all be engaged in a similar dialogue. Right? And we'll do the best uh, that we can to facilitate best practice sharing through that um, group dialogue. Uh, as far as the, the second question, I think the, the report itself being more broadly shared, um, we can certainly do. We can't share the data uh, because we promised people we wouldn't share it in a de-averaged way. So, so a one organization way, because it's actually fairly easy to reverse engineer who the organizations are based on the parameters we've asked them to fill in. Uh, so you know, could we give a more granular view upon request? I'm sure we could, um, but we can't certainly send the uh, spreadsheets around. Thank you very much for your presentation. The uh, question is, uh, speaking of synergies, which I think is very key to all the discussions that have been going on, uh, Imagine Canada mm. is an organization that's been around for years and does a lot of statistical analysis and metric development and metric analysis. And uh, how is it that BCG sees itself either being a synergistic partner with them or operating separately? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think um, as, far as, the, uh, as far as the genesis of the survey itself, we talk to Imagine Canada quite frequently actually, engage with them heavily through that preparatory dialogue because they've walked this path before us and had lots of great insight to share. And they really helped shape our thinking in terms of the types of questions we need to. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Sorry, carry on. It, in terms of the types of questions that, um, that we wanted to ask. Uh, as far as going forward, to be honest, you know, BCG is not a report writing company. We write reports, uh, but we write reports to foster change. And we, while we do statistical analysis, statistical analysis is not our product. So I think you know, at the end of the day, uh, synergy with any organization that wants to perpetuate this type of work um, would be very valuable to us. You know, it's unlikely. I can't say impossible, but it's unlikely we would refresh this type of work, you know, year over year over year, that it has to be sustainable in some way. For us, it was really about identifying, setting a foundation for identifying where um, the critical problems are, and again, what we, we might be able to do about it in our small way, and how we might enable other people to do more in their way. Uh, so uh, partnerships around the type of work we've just talked about here today would, um, be very valuable, we're very open to those. A couple of other observations on that. I was uh, on a panel, it's actually related to the partnership uh, project where Imagine Canada said, this is our best guess data. Mm. It's really our best guess and, and it would be terrific if we could have a different level of analysis. So I want to applaud BCG for taking it to a whole other level. The other thing is I understand the work um, around the language of social impact sector is it's going to be phased, but we're starting, you know, starting with the charities because the data is available. But more broadly, nonprofits, and more broadly, uh, social ventures, and and possibly more broadly still, what that means around that um, creating shared value or corporate social innovation kind of space, which is brand new stuff, and which I think Imagine doesn't have the um, desire to go into that realm. So I think sort of the baseline, starting with the baseline here, and then moving into those other areas, will be a huge contribution to this emergent and nascent sector. Thank you for your presentation. Um, <laughs> you're as bad as me. It's, Excuse me, let me cough. <laughs> um, I, um, I'm a piano accompanist at a nursery school. I'm a bit of a dying breed. I um, was devastated to see uh, the arts, culture, and music segment, uh, which only confirms my reality in uh, terms of community, or arts, and culture. And I am wondering, um, I think part of the difficulty is that people don't understand the huge benefit um, to development and social interaction that music and uh, culture enjoy. And I just wanted to put out this appeal to say, don't abandon them just because they don't have money. That we need more because that's the stuff that brings people together. Thank you. So. I think, um, so we had them as one of, the, one of the groups that sees themselves as shrinking. Uh, and, and so um, that doesn't mean that that's not where we want to focus our energy. And I, I have to say that um, 
I have a liberal arts undergrad, even though I sold out and became an MBA later, uh, that I was, uh, I, I studied poetry for the first four years of my post-secondary education. And so I can relate to arts and culture having a tremendous amount of impact uh, and being a place uh, of, of value creation. And so um, I wouldn't want to let go of them either. And I think the challenge that we've uncovered and actually the qualitative answers um, spoke to this in volumes and said, that is the hardest impact to measure. That, you know, in the impact measurement work we've done to some degree, um, you know, they would assert that we've, we've plucked the low-hanging fruit. I, I'd argue that it's, you know, still fairly high up in the tree, but that to say, you know, how do you quantify the impact of a piano recital? Does that mean that it's not there? And I think the answer is no, but I think it's incumbent on us to say, well, oh, that's a wicked problem that we should solve. Okay, so I, um, I will ask the last question, if that's okay with the group, which is, what are the plans for distribution? Can you talk a little bit more about sort of next steps and sure. where you want to go from there? Sure. So I think the, uh, we, have, we have two short-term steps that are quite apparent, readily apparent to us, and then the third step, less so. So the first short-term step is actually complete the analysis, right? So there, we have a few, few more weeks left of turning and churning this data and teasing out what the real insights and implications are. We shared with you, and I see some BCGers nodding in the back because they know that's the work they're going to be doing for the next mm -hmm. few weeks. Um, but um, you know, the, the truth is we've got to get that right first. And then we have an obligation to the 16 to 1700 souls who fed the information into us to make sure they get it back first and they have the opportunity to engage on that. Um, post that, in terms of sharing it more broadly, um, we don't have a clear plan. We're going to be developing that over the course of the next couple of weeks. But uh, I could say that if you want to be on that distribution list, um, whoever scribbled the email down, make that part of what you feed into and we'll happily add you as you know, one of the first test audiences we've had. And so one of the things we're doing, uh, we have filmed the event today, uh, we're filming the event tonight, and uh, for those that were today, they will know that the province of Ontario has launched a, a social innovation wiki, and if you um, just go on Twitter and use the hashtag S I O N T for Social Innovation Ontario, you will see um, uh, access uh, to the wiki, and we are really encouraging folks to please uh, go online and uh, sign up and put some of your thoughts in about the things you heard today or what you're thinking about social innovation in Ontario, what the possibilities are, and maybe even mentioning the work of BCG and how we can build off that. Um, yeah, so it'll take a, um, I'm looking at my AV guys, it'll take a week and a half or so to get edited and, and up, and it'll be on the Mars site, and we will send out um, a notice to everybody that's registered for this session, uh, referring, uh, referring you to that. It's been a really long day, but it's been really terrific, uh, really invigorating, and I want to thank you for hanging out with us, and uh, please join me in welcoming BCG for their great work, and thank you very much. <laughs>